I have a, a little deck on Brave because Brave's a different browser. It's it's fun to talk about, and I get to um, you know be different from just trying to keep up with all the cool dev tools and um, web VR and such. It's awesome um, not to have to work in the salt mines of browser engines after twenty some years. Uh, you all work for me. <laughs> um, one thing I'm excited about that's coming in, uh, I hope this year, is finally getting some kind of better numeric type into JavaScript. So I've been working uh, with Daniel Ehrenberg of Egalia, formerly the V8 team, who's the champion of the integer proposal in TC39. It's at stage two. It is an arbitrary precision uh, integer for JavaScript. Uh, you will use it conveniently with uh, what we think will be the N suffix for the second letter of integer, because capital I doesn't work so well. Um, and it's, it's spelled integer, the constructor name. And it, it's kind of like the wrapper for uh, IEEE doubles. It's called number, capital N. So it, it works like a, a sort of built-in primitive type with all the usual good affordances you need to actually use it, like operators. And one of the, the things that you, you will be relieved to hear is that it won't implicitly convert in, in lossy or crazy ways to um, double precision numbers. People have trouble in JavaScript because 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 does not equal 0 0.3. The same is true in Java with doubles or C or any other language using the IEEE floating point standard. But I get all the blame for it because it's all my fault, just like NANS. Um, so integers coming, that, that's got me excited because I think people are still struggling um, with uh, you know, the, the limits of floating point in JavaScript. Like I, I heard recently there was a Node API that reflects the, the Unix stat system call result, including the inode number. And people have huge file systems now, and apparently they have inode numbers, maybe they're, not, they're sparse or something, that, oh, that you need more than 53 bits of integer <laughs> to count all the the files in your file system. And so they're, they're losing precision in JavaScript, and they're blaming me again, of course. Um, so we're going to have integers sometime soon, I think. There's commitment to implement, and Egalia has talent to actually do some of the work for not only V8, but other engines like SpiderMonkey and JavaScript Core. OK, um, this is what I wanted to show. There you go. Fetch in, in uh, Safari, awesome. Uh, OK. Uh, integers, you can read about on GitHub. All the TC39 work happens on GitHub. Um, things still take too long in standards, but at least they're on a yearly um, update cadence. And with people like Dan, little Dan on Twitter working hard on it, I think uh, it'll happen. Um, you can see even sort of a little ASM.js flavor of it. Um, it's not that easy to use by hand if you're trying to keep everything in 64 bits. Uh, if you're just using big integers, you don't have to worry. They, they don't lose precision. They get as big as you want. Pretty good for machine learning and, and scientific stuff. OK, let me talk about Brave. I think my, my joke about working in the browser salt mines, uh, escaping, and then having you all work for me aside, I think there is a problem on the web that's at a higher level than DevTools or WASM or whatever. Um, and it, it, it isn't really perceived as such because um, People don't connect their data plan if they're on a tiered data plan. They don't connect the part that goes to ads and tracking to <laughs> their bill. Um, and you know, I think Addy actually nicely showed a little bit in the, the DevTools waterfall there. You could see there were beacons for advertising or tracking. Uh, it's actually taking a lot of bandwidth. It takes a lot of time on the network, which means your smartphone radio is running, which is the number one or two consumer of your battery. So you're losing battery life. Um, so you're paying for it. You're actually paying for the internet because you're paying for your data that goes to trackers. Um, Potch mentioned background tabs. Background tabs are doing insidious things like, like using web audio to sort of keep themselves alive or possibly do audio fingerprinting. I don't know. I'm, I'm very suspicious. Uh, there's all sorts of, of mischief there. Why should we run that stuff? When we did the web, uh, uh, made it commercial at Netscape, we, you know, we, we had this sort of opinion about turning off things that were unsafe. We had to you know, integrate FTP and WACE and Gopher and HTTP. But in, at the end of the 90s, it, a lot of those were, were dying or dead. And it really was important, I think, at that point to protect users from things like pop-ups. Unfortunately, we didn't do a good job until Firefox, like 2003 or 4. 
maybe Mozilla before that, a few other browsers did it. And blocking pop-ups was this case of the browser being opinionated that actually worked. We, we stopped pop-up ads before they got too big and, and we would have had huge commercial evil forces arrayed against us. But, but uh, that didn't happen with uh, other kinds of tracking ads. And so I think it's important for browsers to be opinionated about this stuff. I think it might be important to even have standards that, that address this, because right now it's kind of a, a mix across browsers, how you deal with things like pop-ups and ads. Uh, pop-ups more or less have a consensus-based blocking, and maybe there's some standard in the W3C I haven't seen. But uh, tracking is a mess. It's taking up all this, this uh, time on the network, and you can see it on these sites. I think Boston.com is particularly egregious. I think they might have fixed it. But um, if you're paying half your bill of your data plan uh, for, for tracking, something's wrong. And uh, it's not really getting better because I think having talked to publishers, including big ones, nobody wants to risk revenue. So uh, ad blocking is the natural sort of immune response among users. If you get annoyed by all this cost, you get annoyed by a bad ad, and the ads are just the surface of the scene, they're sort of the tip of the iceberg, then you may get an ad blocker. And now you're really out of the whole ecosystem. You're, you're now blocking ads, and if it's a good ad blocker, trackers everywhere, which means even sites that do a decent job or try to you know, have good content and, and decent ads to make a living, make ends meet, are being punished. Seems like a problem. So with a great team, I built Brave to address this directly. So we're trying to not only block ads as a baseline, we're blocking trackers, pretty important. This means we are a lot faster. Um, like on Android, we're three to six times faster. On iOS, three to seven times faster uh, than the stock browser that does not block ads. And uh, on Android, Chrome doesn't have an ad blocking extension API. You have to get a different browser. So you really need to get something that solves the problem deeply. It blocks the requests early. It's like the uh, Hydra head. Didn't Hercules cut off the Hydra head and then burn the stump so it couldn't grow again? Otherwise, you kept getting more Hydra heads. That's what happens with the network waterfall with all these trackers, uh, as I think Addie nicely demonstrated. Um, another way to look at it is the ghostry D3 tracking graph. It's pretty fun, good use of D3 ball and stick physics. Kind of horrifying. This is TMZ. A lot of media sites do it. They've gone like crazy for third-party tracking and ad partners, so-called header bidding. They have like not only their own domain shards there, which is legit, but they have obviously double click and everybody else. It's almost like they went and, and said to the entire ad tech complex, partner with us, we'll, we'll add your tag to our page and slow it down even more. I, I didn't want to pick on The Verge, but Addy showed that too, and it's still slow on mobile. I mean, it's, it's, it's not getting better fast enough. And it's, it, it's not really just you know, the DOM's fault. It's, it's ads and tracking. So with Brave, we put a shield up around the user. We show you the results of that shield, which really saves you time, uh, blocks things. And we keep your data safe on your device, which is the only you know, way to get bargaining power against all these, these um, people in the middle of the ecosystem, all, all the little balls there floating around you when you go to TMZ, for instance. Um, a site I do not, do not frequent myself. Um, and we build it all in. I, I think it's awesome to have extensions if you're allowed. Uh, can't have them on Chrome and Android. If you have the Safari ad blocker content blocking extensions that have an app install model, that can be more convenient. But it's still this other mouth to feed. Most users don't really want to figure out how to use these. They don't always play nice together. The content blocking API is somewhat limited on Safari, though I'm sure Apple's making it awesome in future releases. Um, so we put it all in one box, make it easy, easy to use, and test it. And that's important, because if you don't QA this, as anybody who's used an ad blocking extension knows, you often end up with a sort of malfunctioning site or a white screen of death, or a site that says, hey, you're using an ad blocker. We hate you. You know, turn it off or you know, subscribe or die. And the sites that do that generally lose traffic. It's not a good thing to do, but it happens. In Brave, we actually engineer around that kind of junk. We, we figure out ways to, to fake them out. They were pretty much blue-pilled in our matrix. There was a paper from Princeton on this recently that talked about how it was a little bit hyped. It said the end of the ad block rewards. It said the browser ultimately can figure out what's an ad and what's not because humans can detect ads often by their opt-out widgetry. If you can do that as a human, then machine learning or even simple OCR techniques can do it. You can block ads in the browser. They had a more clever thing in the paper, I thought, which was using the, the isolated worlds feature in Chromium to make two worlds, one for the content to load so that the publisher's anti-ad blocker detector 
can think, oh, no ad blocking here, nothing to do to tell the user to go away. And in the other world, ad blocking happens. Um, sorry, publishers, you cannot count on being able to detect ad blockers. And Brave is proof of that. Um, we're doing more because ad blocking and tracking protection are good defensive measures, entirely justified, moral, and ethical within your rights as a web user. The web was designed to allow mix and match, screen readers, ad blocking. Uh, no DRM for ads, please. Could happen. DRM's coming into the W3C. But we, we added a, a micro donation system as well. It's in uh, ending its first beta. We're going to do a second beta that's even better with Stripe as a partner. So you can just pledge whatever you want, $5, $7.50, $10, $20 a month to be automatically apportioned among sites you like. You don't have to think about it until near the end of a 30-day uptime period. Then you can sort of say, I don't want that site. But it's all based on private, on-device, in your browser-only analytics, not on any site, not on Brave servers. And at the end of 30 days, your donations go through a zero-knowledge proof protocol across a VPN. So we don't see the sites. Nobody sees the sites. But the money piles up in pro rata shares among the websites. We've onboarded over 157, I think, sites so far, with 150 or more in the queue. You go to publishers.brave.com if you want to collect your money. As we grow, there's more money. Some of the sites are really big. We'll announce their names soon. We're making sure that they are OK with that. Um, and going forward, we'll have it be easy for people to say, I want to be listed as a, as a publisher who's paid through this mechanism. Um, that, that is something that I'm excited about, but I don't expect it to really go uh, all the way in replacing ad revenue. Patreon is an interesting uh, site that's done well, but you have to sign up as a creator there to get patronized for Patreon. So we're adding something to our micropayments, micro-donation system that's called pinned donations. You can see the orange pins there. Uh, so you can actually sort of say, I want to commit 10% uh, you know, of my uh, monthly budget to a site, whether I go there or not, whether I browse there or not. And um, again, it's through a zero-knowledge proof protocol. There is no link back. This has interesting properties. Anonymity has consequences. You can't get a refund. Um, you're, you're committing a small amount of change to sites you like. I think people are willing to do this, considering how much the tracking costs them in their data plan and how much we save there. Uh, sprinkling some back uh, in an irrevocable way among your top sites seems like a fair deal. Uh, but, but again, will donations be enough? Maybe not. So we're looking at blockchain-based digital advertising. And this isn't just blockchain hype. We really do see a need for aggregate attestation through something like a blockchain, a neutral, decentralized proof system. Because there's so much fraud and hype in ad tech. This is a famous picture from uh, Terry Kawaja's Luma Partners. It's called a Lumascape diagram. It shows the ecosystem that evolved since <laughs> uh, the cross-site image. That's Mark Andreessen's fault and Eric Bina. Uh, the cookie, Luma and Thule. But he, Lou had a good idea for the cookie. It was for first-party logging credential caching, not for third-party tracking. But just between the image, which you could load from your friend's cat server, and the cookie, you had third-party tracking. Because every request can send and return a cookie. And that means that you can have an image that's on two sites from a third site track your navigation to those two first party sites. And that's exactly how trackers work the first. They even call them pixels still, even though they don't use images, they use scripts. Because when I did JavaScript and then added script source equal in 96, it just added fuel to the fire. So this whole crazy ecosystem, and you can see everybody's in there, it, it is, is like a parasite infested uh, swamp. And it's full of hype and fraud and measurement error, measurement fraud. Innocent errors, no, you know, who knows? Intentions don't matter. It's really the consequences of this, which is there's too much money taken out by the middle players, too many entry points for fraud and malware, which has happened, malvertisement. Uh, estimates of 16 billion being wasted in fraud this year. So we want to clean that up. And part of that is, like I said, using the blockchain for what it's good at, which is recording aggregate um, results and sort of trends so that you can have uh, no fraud. You can have no trusted intermediary who might be, you know, in some bad part of the world, might be a fraud actor. Um, and we, we really do want to help these publishers who are suffering this revenue loss that has been going on for, uh, especially in, in the last 15 or so years. You can see it on this chart. I know on Twitter someone did a chart to show Google and Facebook revenue, which was rising in a blue line to uh, sort of complement that cliff dive at the end there. Um, that's, a, that's an issue we see. Not to pick on Google and Facebook, I think you know, in terms of web standards, Google and Apple have to cooperate more. 
But Facebook is, is doing a bunch of generative JavaScript work, and, and that's awesome. But they're also you know, doing an ad business. And that means that they're sort of the junior partner in the new duopoly. People thought, you know, oh, it would be Windows all over again. You know, the smartphone would get taken over by Microsoft. I remember talking to Andy Rubin in 2006 when he was starting Android, and that was the fear. And it's, it's different. History rhymes, but it does not repeat. And we now have this situation where, uh, even with that crazy loom escape full of, of middle players and parasites and, and third parties and seventh parties, uh, Google and Facebook are the Pareto power law, you know, winners. And this is taking a lot of money out, and it's putting a lot of tracking data into those giant walled gardens. And then those walled gardens are saying to the publishers, especially the newspapers, come and put your news content in our garden. It's nice here. We, we trim the hedges, and we, we kill the pests. And the problem, I think, for the publishers is they lose control of their brand. Their news content gets broken down into little commodity pieces, uh, and they kind of die. They continue to go off that cliff. So. Can we do something with blockchain-based digital advertising? We have plans. We're launching a token on Ethereum. Pretty excited about this. This is a unit of account, uh, medium of exchange. It's something that we actually want to stake users with. We're doing it because you can't really claw back money for the user in this ad tech system. And if you go ask for it, people will laugh at you. The middle players already take big cuts. The publisher is getting less and less. So we're re-monetizing the user by creating a new token. The token also allows us to use zero-knowledge proofs on the Ethereum blockchain eventually. Initially, we have them in Brave. Uh, and we will be working on this in sort of a space program sense. We're in the current Mercury Redstone suborbital phase. But I think we will get to a decentralized, transparent ad exchange that has anonymity, has micro-donations, has other properties that you want from such a system, and does not require a giant walled garden central trusted party. So that's the basic attention token. That's part of our attempt to uh, make up for the loss of advertising revenue, such as it is. And I'll stop there to avoid taking more time. Thanks. Hey there. Are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? Then join this dot instructor, Ben Lesh, to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. Available online and in person, Go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to book your spot today. Hey there, do you use Angular? Do you like fun in the sun? And how do you feel about boats? If you're nodding yes, then uh, come join us on NG Cruise to learn more about Angular while on a fabulous Caribbean cruise. Check out ngcruise.com for speaker lineup, workshop details, and to book your spot today.